Oh, I'm starting to record now. Okay, fine. That's good. Yeah. Ooh, okay, right. so um, I'm also trying to admit, oh, okay, uh, one last admission just happened, and that's the end of my admissions. Maybe I should switch hosting to you so you can admit people. Okay. Let's see about that. Okay. You're now the host, but that might mean I can't share a screen. I'll find out in a moment. You're right, I can't. So, so um, just, okay. Sophia's joined. Oh. See, now I'm blocked from my own screen. Oh, sorry. I, I made you host, but I can't do that. And now I have to make you unhost it, but I don't know how to do that. Sorry. Oh, reclaim host. There we go. Okay. But that, I'm sorry, Roger. That's the best I can do. No, no problem. No problem. Yeah. Here we go. Okay. Here we go. Um, this is a, this slideshow, everybody can hear me, yes? This slideshow um, is going to be a, a, a continuing uh, um, project. Uh, uh, I will have put onto a Dropbox site that you can take down um, the first version of it, but it's going to evolve as, as I continue to talk. Um, the here is the Dropbox link, which should remain constant. Uh, if you can take a shot of that and then use it, you'll be able to get the slideshow and some other things, papers and so on. I'll leave that up for a moment. I'm I'm going to talk about some things in general for a little while today. And then I'm going to talk about the Alexander polynomial, the way Alexander did it to begin with, and then some evolution of that. Here's a list of people who are related to the various themes as I see it that happen in the knot theory. Uh, Lord Kelvin, uh, is in some sense the originator of the knot tables at the very least, because he had the theory that atoms were knotted vortices in the luminiferous ether. And Peter Guthrie Tate and Kirkman and Little made knot tables for him. Um, Dane uh, did some of the first serious work in knot theory uh, using the fundamental group. Alexander wrote his paper about the famous polynomial in 1928. Kurt Reitermeister wrote the first book on knot theory. Seifert has already been mentioned here. Um, and then we have some others, Emil Arden, Ralph Fox, John Horton Conway, Vaughn Jones, Edward Witten, Vasiliev Kovanov, and of course, others. Um, as I said, in the 19th century, Sir William Thompson, Lord Kelvin, had a theory of knotted atoms. Uh, and somehow this theme keeps coming back in one way or another. I hope to talk about some of the physical things as we go along, but not too much physics today. Uh, here's a, uh, another Victorian knotted atom uh, due to the visionaries Bessat and Ledbetter. Who, so those ideas were in the air uh, about knots and uh, fundamentals back then. Um, these are uh, resources of mine. Uh, of course, there are many resources about knot theory, but I just thought I would show you uh, some of my resources. There's this book, Knots and Physics. There is the book, Knots and Applications, which has some reprints of, um, of um, Kelvin's work, among other things. Um, there's the book, Formal Knot Theory. 
on the book, Temporally Lieb Recoupling Theory and Invariance of Three Manifolds, and the book on knots. And then there's knot tables. And I thought the follow, uh, well, first of all, I do recommend if you're actually new to knot theory, that you take a look at the knot tables and, and uh, wonder about them because they contain all sorts of phenomena and examples, quite amazing. Uh, if you look at the knot tables, you'll find that every knot is alternating for quite a while uh, until you get up into certain eight crossing knots. And then you will find ones that do not go over, under, over, under, over, under all the way along. And uh, for example, uh, if you look at this table, you will see that 819 is not alternating, and that's the first one, and can be proved to be non-alternating. And there are many other phenomena, so it's a lot of fun to look at knot tables. I once got an email uh, from someone about knot tables, and I didn't know what this email was going to be until I played the little movie uh, that they had made along with it. So I thought I would show it to you. As you see, he says, knots came up in our conversation and um, I made a table about a knot, I made a movie about a knot table. Hmm? Uh, and this was the movie. As you see, they made a real knot table. <laughs> <laughs> Which knot did they use? Well, they zeroed in on the knot tables in the book. And whoops, that was too fast. But there's the knot, as you see. So there are a lot of variants on the knot tables. Um, and of course, we've been talking for sec two lectures now about what is knot theory about. But here's a puzzle for you if you haven't uh, looked at it before. Uh, maybe you want to make a record of this screenshot or whatever. The question is, is it knotted or not? Um, and then, as I said, I'm, I'm sort of digressing today or wandering a little bit before I get down to brass tacks with uh, Alexander's original paper. So uh, a great problem about knots is what's the least amount of rope for a given diameter that you need to tie a given knot? And um, good for experimenting if you have a rope. Like... What is, what's it going to be like for 942? And, um, and people have computer programs where they, computer programs pull the knot up tight. You can do this with a rope, but the computer program can do it also. And that's, uh, other than some estimates of various kinds, no one has exact answers to the, these questions. No one knows the precise length to diameter ratio for even the trefoil knot. You can approximate it with a computer program like this by pulling it up and measuring the length. This program is due to Jason Cantarella and if you're interested in more of that, you can find it on his website. Another experiment I like with knots is making paper strip and pulling those up tight. The most famous one and very well known is that if you uh, tie a paper strip uh, it carefully in a trefoil knot and pull it so that it's quite flat, it will fold up and give you a very nice regular pentagon. And I say it's intuitively clear that the pentagonal form of the trefoil knot uses the least length of paper for a given width of paper, but no one has proved that seems hard to understand what the configuration space is. Um, other random thoughts. A knot is a pattern that's independent of the substrate upon which it is imposed, yet the substrate and its relationship with the ambient space is necessary. When you think of the concept of an elementary particle, you expect a concurrence of form and substance. What do knots tell us about the concept of form? Patterned integrity was Buckminster Fuller's term for independence of substrate. And it's very interesting to think about that. It's a theme in many magic tricks because knots get transferred from one thing to another, like from your knotted arms to the rope. 
And we've mentioned already the Rademeister moves. And here are some other substrates, like a pseudo three-dimensional Borromean rings made to look very realistic, or a knot diagram, or a photograph of DNA, a micro photomicrograph of DNA, which by a series of evidences and understandings shows that the DNA is knotted. And the Reitermeister moves, which should probably be called the Alexander Briggs Reitermeister moves, since in the 1920s, it was Alexander and Briggs who formalized and proved that they worked. And then a very clean and nice proof was given by Reitermeister in his book. And then Ken Perko tells me that I should say the Maxwell Alexander Briggs moves, Reitermeister moves, because Maxwell found the moves way back then. And uh, Roger talked about three coloring. And I like to illustrate three coloring and play around with it. So for example, here I have some three different kinds of colorings on the trefoil, um, brick, woven and um and we'll call the other one black so those are my three colors brick woven and black and you can move it around and when you move it around you get a unique extension of the coloring to the new diagram obtained by pushing it around and you keep on pushing it around and it keeps getting uniquely recolored and won't lose any of its colors and so you've proved that the truffle knot is knotted because the unknot won't do that. It'll always be singly colored. But I'm sure Roger will talk more about coloring soon. One of us will anyway. Uh, now we get to the heart of the matter for today. This is Alexander's paper uh, from 1928, uh, Transactions of the American Mathematical mm -hmm. Society. And you can find this on JSTOR easily enough. It's worth looking at it. Um, Let's look at what he says. He says it appears to be difficult to find invariants. And on the other hand, he succeeds in finding some. And he says there exists one invariant in particular that's quite simple and effective in the form of a polynomial delta of x. And at the end of the paper, he's tabulated it uh, from those tables of Tate and Kirkman. And, uh, and it turns out that it can distinguish a lot of knots. And then he remarks that the invariants found in this paper are all intimate related to the knot group as defined by Dane. Uh, and at the end of the paper, we'll find remarks about how his work is related to the knot group. But the paper itself proceeds entirely combinatorially, and I'll show you how, mm -hmm. To, get, to make a matrix whose determinant is the Alexander polynomial. So you don't need to know the knot group, but you would be curious where the matrix came from and want to know about the knot group. I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to show you the matrix and then some interesting things that are related to it. So we'll dwell on this slide for a few minutes. Alexander had a notation, the double dot notation. Uh, when the oriented line goes underneath, then to the left, you put two dots. The two dots correspond to the variable x. So you could have just as well labeled it as x, x, and one, and one. Now, if you look at Alexander's paper, you will find that there are some minus signs among the x's and the ones. I have removed them here because it turns out that his definition doesn't need them. And so it's easier to look at without the minus signs and correct. So I am rewriting history here and imagining that Alexander noticed that and made this definition. So what that means is that there is a module um, uh, generated by the labels for the regions. And there is an equation, xa plus xb plus c plus d equals zero for each crossing. 
and we will write the matrix of that system of equations. I won't dwell about the module. I'm just going to talk about the matrix. So there's the matrix over there on the right. Um, as you see, um, you just read it. Um, like you look at, um, you look at, um, at A, and I, I mean, you look at the um, crossing on the upper left, and you see an X at A, an X at D, uh, a one at B, and a one at E. You read it off in that way. Now, you get when you do that, you get a matrix with two more columns than it has rows, because there are two more regions in an op diagram, then there are vertices, crossings, which is a good exercise. And so we eliminate two adjacent rows, or columns, eliminate two adjacent columns. So I have starred them here, A and B have been eliminated, and I get a little three by three matrix, and the determinant of that three by three matrix is the Alexander polynomial. Now this turns out to only be determined up to powers of x product with powers of x or a sign. In this case, it comes out in the way I like it as x squared minus x plus one. So that's Alexander's uh, method for producing his polynomial. And of course, in the paper, he then proceeds to prove that it does not depend on the choice of adjacent regions that you eliminated columns for. And that uh, it's invariant under the Reitermeister moves. So there you have it. And if you care to calculate an Alexander polynomial, this is not a bad way to go. Um, write that matrix into your computer and take its determinant. And uh, you can do it for knots of quite some size. Or you could write a program that will accept it on the basis of some coding for the diagram. So what I want to talk about here is some of the combinatorial properties of this determinant, and I'm going to reformulate it. And after it's fully reformulated, which might take us a few minutes, we will find that we have landed on the Conway-Alexander polynomial. We've landed on Conway's refinement of the Alexander polynomial that allows you to compute it without any matrices or determinants. Um, I do not know how Conway discovered his refinement. He may have been looking at Alexander's original paper and looking for a simplification, or he may have been doing something else. He never told the story, but there is a famous paper by Conway uh, in which all these patterns that he discovered are docketed. So you now know how to compute the Alexander polynomial. I'm going to introduce a notation. This notation puts a little marker, not a dot, but uh, a single dot, you might say, but fills in a corner, one of the four corners at a crossing. And that filled in corner or marker can be thought of as saying that the region A chooses the crossing K. So for example, over here in this slide, uh, in the leftmost diagram in the middle, region C has chosen crossing one, region E has chosen crossing two, and region D has chosen crossing three. Now look just below it, and you see a three by three matrix in which column C has chosen row one, column D has chosen row three, and column E has chosen row two. So you see that if I were to make choices from regions to crossings by putting in markers, I will have indicated on the knot diagram a particular choice of choices in the three by three matrix whose determinant is going to be the Alexander polynomial. 
Now up here in the upper left, I have written the determinant that I have in mind. This is a slightly different diagram, so you can compare again. Um, I've, uh, I've eliminated A and B, and I have C, E, and D, and crossing numbers one, two, and three, and I have shown you on the upper right the Alexander labels on those crossings. So you might take a look up there, bear with me and take a look. Uh, let's say we want row one of the matrix. Row one is asking, what does C choose? What does D choose? And what does E choose? So you look for crossing number one. You have to look at just crossing number one, which is in the upper left of the right hand bit. And you see that C has a one and E has a one and D has a zero. So C chooses one, E chooses one, D chooses zero there. In the second row, to do it one more, uh, you see that C is getting an X, D is getting a one, and E is getting a one. So getting back to what are the terms in the determinant? Well, when you expand mm -hmm. a determinant, you must have a unique choice from say, column to row, each column choosing a unique row in some way. Those then you take the product of the entries in them and you get the determinant of the matrix. Some such things will give you zero. For example, if D chose one and C chose two and E chose three, you get zero because the entry in the one D entry in the matrix is zero. What I have indicated below are the three non-zero entries in the expansion of the determinant. In order to have a non-zero entry in the expansion of the determinant, it must be that a region chooses one of the crossings and another region chooses another one of the crossings and, a re and another. You have to have each region choosing a unique crossing so that the states in the determinant, the terms in the expansion of the determinant, correspond to labelings by markers in such a way that each region chooses one crossing. And that's what we've enumerated here across the line. I have three states, and I have the three choices in the uh, three choices in the three by three matrix that have not that give me non-zero results. And underneath them, I've written the product of the entries in the matrix. And you'll see that we get minus x, 1, and uh, oh, I lost an x somewhere. Uh, yep. The, one, the last one on the lower right needs two x's. The two, it's got an x and an x and a 1. Sorry about that. And of course, then they have to alternate. We haven't gotten out of the determinant yet. You have to have the sign of the permutation. So the sign of the middle one is uh, one. And maybe I got the signs right in the others. But you need the sign of the permutation so far. OK? So, uh, so we can look into the diagram and see what are the non-zero terms in the determinant. And they turn out to be these kind of labelings of the diagram. Now the sign. It turns out that the sign of the permutation can be replaced by a count of the number of markers between inward pointing arcs. So I call a marker between two inward pointing arcs a black hole. And I want to know how many black holes are there in this diagram. And for example, in this state that's illustrated here, there's one black hole and the other two are not black holes. Uh, and uh, the sign of the state will be by definition minus one to the number of black holes, the parity of the number of black holes. It turns out that you can replace the permutation sign by that. And once you've done that, you then have a completely combinatorial story for the Alexander polynomial. You list the marker states, for each one, you take the product of the labels that are called upon by the markers. 
which means the labels that would be in those entries in the matrix. You take their product <clears throat> and you multiply that by the sign of the state. So in this case, uh, you see that uh, the, um, the first one on the upper left has one black hole and has a minus X. So it's, it has an X, so it's minus X. The next one, just to the right of it, has no black holes and is three ones, so it's a one. And the one down at the bottom has two X's and two black holes, so it's also plus X squared. And there's, there's the Alexander polynomial, the trefoil again. But by now, this has been defined entirely combinatorially from the diagram as a sum over the states with these evaluations. It takes some work to prove that all this works, but uh, that's the formula. So, uh, so, uh, so as you see, Alexander's formula can be translated into a state sum on the diagram in this way, and then one can investigate that state sum and see what one can do with it. You might have some fun trying this out. Say, take the uh, figure eight knot and try the same game. Um, one of the combinatorial properties of these states is that you can get from one to another by a move of interchanging markers. Here I'm rotating the markers in a clockwise way, two adjacent markers like that and I get a new state. And of course I can rotate counterclockwise if I want to and go backwards. Um, the theorem is that the states form a lattice uh, in which one state is uniquely clocked, only clockwise moves available on it, and, and the bottom of the lattice is uniquely anti-clocked, only an counterclockwise moves available. And all the states in between, and all the states are obtained by doing clockwise moves from the clocked state. Uh, and this is um, important for checking that those signs really work for the parity of the number of black holes. And this theorem takes a little work to prove. Um, we aren't proving it here. But it's the combinatorial background uh, for the Alexander polynomial looked at this way. Now, another point about these states is the following. Split each crossing at a state marker according to the scheme shown. If there's a marker, then you break open uh, to form a smoothing in such a way uh, that it splits it as indicated. So you can get one or the other of the two possible unoriented smoothings of the crossing from this. And if you do it on a state, you will find that you get one single traverse of the knot diagram, never crossing at a crossing. You get one curve. Um, and that the collection of single curves of this kind um, is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the states. I once encountered a puzzle book which uh, gave this as a a puzzle. You have a roadway system like a knot diagram and you are supposed to go through every um, partial road in the system uh, once and never go through an intersection. You always turn at an intersection. And um, this um, articulation of these states solves that problem completely. You can enumerate all of them this way. Another fact about knot diagrams is that any knot or link diagram can be two colored. Two colored, like I've indicated here. Each region is colored either black or white. And if two regions uh, share an edge, they're colored differently. I leave that as an exercise for you to prove um, with the hint that it has something to do with the Jordan curve theorem. And then you can form a graph associated with such a coloring. Um, here I have indicated G of D as the white region graph, and it consists in one vertex for each white region and one edge for each 
crossing shared between two regions. This is sometimes called the checkerboard graph of the knot diagram. Now it turns out that the maximal trees in the checkerboard graph are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the states that we've been just talking about. And how does that look? How does that happen? Well, um, you grow a tree in T, and then you find that you have produced edges that go through a lot of crossings, and some crossings are left alone, as you see. And if you then grow a corresponding tree in the black regions, that will be uniquely determined by what you already did and a choice of starting point, a choice of root. So I put a root in the outer region and I'm going to put another root in that region um, down there in the bottom. So you see where I have my stars now. I have two stars and I've grown uh, a tree from the outer region, uh, which is one of the stars. Uh, down into the white regions. That's a choice. And then I have the other tree, T hat, and I find that it's uniquely determined uh, by starting from the other starred region. So given two starred regions, two, rooted, two root places, and one tree, you get two trees uniquely, mm -hmm. and those trees then determine markers uh, and give you a state. The way you get the markers from the trees is you walk from the root, and when you go through a crossing, you put a marker as you went through, just like in the picture here. So states are in correspondence with single cycle traverses through the whole knot diagram, and they are in correspondence with maximal trees in the checkerboard graph. And all of these turn out to be useful facts to use in dealing with the Alexander polynomial and sometimes useful facts in general. And now I want to do a new labeling. So here's our old labeling over on the right, upper right, X, X oh no it isn't, um, sorry. On the upper left, I replaced X by X squared in our original labeling, okay? I hope I'm not confusing you, but remember our original labeling, it was, it was Alexander's dots on the two squares labeled X squared. And with Alexander, we put an X there, but I'm going to replace the X by an X squared. And then I'm going to multiply by one over X, which means I'm multiplying some rows in the matrix by one over X. It would change the determinant by a power of X. I don't care. And now I have this labeling. And now I look at it on positive and negative crossings, the very same labeling that I've created. And as you see, with a positive crossing, I get, uh, I get the uh, two X's on the left. And with a negative crossing, I get them a little bit higher because it's been turned around. The under crossing line now goes down the page. So, there you have it. Now look at it. And you see that the X and the one over X don't change, the vertical X and one over X do not change when you switch the crossing. The horizontal ones change. They interchange from X, one over X to one over X, X. There's a little hint in there that something isn't changing when you flip the crossing. It shouldn't matter very much. It turns out that when you calculate the determinant, those upper ones, the ones that look vertical in the lower part, contribute a rotation number related to the drawing of the diagram and not anything about the over and under crossing structure of the diagram. And you can throw them away and end up with this. So up to equals dot and the change of variable this gives the Alexander polynomial. But this one is, it turns out, all set, perfectly normalized. If you use these weights instead of the original ones 
and use the same state sum that we've already described, you get something which is precisely invariant under the Reitermeister moves and is a model for Conway's polynomial. So there is a line which gets you from, uh, let's do an example. There is a line which gets you from uh, Alexander's original determinant over to a state sum which precisely gives Conway's polynomial. Now, I think I should skip this slide and talk about Conway's polynomial for a moment and then come back to it. So what I'm claiming about this state sum is that if you take a positive crossing and a negative crossing, and then you take the state sum, omega, for it, and take the difference between the two, that you will find that you get x minus x inverse times the result of the smooth link. This is not hard to see from the state sum. Very easy to see. I didn't do a slide about it. You can have a little fun doing the exercise. But we get to the Conway identity, his skein identity, this way. And we have it defined in such a way that it's invariant. So it becomes a model for Conway's skein theory. Conway's skein theory, on the other hand, was told to us by Conway axiomatically. And it looks like this. To every oriented knot or link, there's associated a polynomial, such that equivalent links up to Reitermeister moves receive identical polynomials. And if K is an unknotted circle, then it gives you one. And if you have a skein triple, K positive, K bar negative, L smooth, um, then nabla K minus nabla K bar equals Z nabla L, where Z is the variable. And we'll do an example or two in a moment. But those axioms suffice to calculate it. And it turns out that this all works. So if this was given to you from on high by John Conway, then you would be told that you needn't uh, consider any matrices anymore or any determinants anymore. You should just work with the skein. But then it does have a model. And this is a model for it. And if we went back to the model and calculated, we would see how it would happen. In the model, the z is x minus x inverse. Here's our state sum again with the Conway type labelings on it instead of the other labelings, x forward, 1 over x backward in a positive crossing. Um, the states as we have seen them before, you add them up, multiply, and collect your terms and you will see that you get exactly c squared plus one and everything is fitting nicely. So that's how one can get to Conway's skein identity and a model for it by way of uh, the beginning of Alexander's polynomial. Um, I want to talk a little bit about skein calculations then. Uh, when you do skein calculations, it's important to understand that every link diagram has an unknotted, unlinked choice of crossings. Um, for example, you can draw the diagram so that you go over before you go under every time. So that's the drawing I've produced here. I started at P and I drew the diagram always doing over until I was forced to come back uh, to the same place and then I go under. Um, and I keep on uh, doing that, and I get somebody which is unknotted uh, because you could grab it and pull it upward, and it would just come apart. And of course, that makes a nice exercise for checking that the Reitermeister moves work because indeed it can be undone by Reitermeister moves. And then there is the essence of the skein theory itself. Uh, if you have three links that are in a skein triple, like this, then you could write A is equal to B circle plus C, and B is equal to A uh, circle minus C as generalized identities. They become delta nabla of A plus B is nabla of A plus Z nabla of B. Um, and and the other way around in the, um, you see what I'm saying? Did I say it right? No, 
uh, there's a misprint there, I'm sorry. Um, but you see what I mean, that I will think of A as having been composed of B and C in the sense that I would write the skein identity as nabla A equals nabla B plus Z nabla C. Made a mistake there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, but the, the interesting thing about those operations, plus and minus, is that this is a way to decompose a link. You start with the link with the positive crossing and you decompose it as a formal sum of two links with one, one of which has a reverse crossing. And by using the method on the previous slide, you could eventually reduce it to the unknot by switching crossings to an unknot that's there. Uh, or an unlink that's there. So you, that means that any knot or link that you write can be rewritten in this algebra of pluses and minuses that's non-associative and non-commutative as uh, a combination of unknots and unlinks. And then if you had a polynomial formula, you could put it in and rewrite back into a polynomial. But the decomposition into unknots and unlinks is called the skein decomposition. And Conway was quite prescient in understanding this level of, of the structure and had the questions about, well, what is in the skein? Uh, how much information is in the skein? He didn't know, and we didn't know at the time when, when he was talking about this in the 1970s, that there were other polynomials that would work. Um, and that the whole structure uh, had a lot more uh, uh, robustness uh, than you might have imagined. And it's still open as to how much is in the skein, of course. Um, examples, we're nearing the end. Here's an example. Uh, L is equal to L bar plus K, yeah? Um, that means that delta L bar, we already, uh, oh, delta L bar is just delta of a simple little link and you can check that it's minus C little hop link, pull the loop down. You see, I, I switched it, so that loop goes down. And it's just a, a, a link of linking number one, and you can check that it's minus E. And that tells you, and delta K is the, um, is the truffle knot, and we already worked out that that's one plus E squared. So, so that tells you that uh, delta L over here is going to be, delta L bar minus C plus C times one plus C squared, which turns out to be Z cubed. And what have we done? We've proved that this link on the left is non-trivial. And that link on the left is the whitehead link. It has linking number zero. Um, the circulation around, around the bottom part is uh, positive and the circulation around the top part is Oh, oh, one is negative, the other is positive, linking number zero. So there's a proof that the whitehead link is linked. You could also prove it by using coloring. Maybe we should talk about that at another point. And here's another example. Um, here's a knot um, which is uh, has a class between two trefoil knots there. Um, and if we switch a crossing, then it becomes a connected sum of two trefoil knots, that's M bar. But if we smooth that crossing, which happens, then, and look carefully at the guy I called Q, you see it's unlinked. And you can check that Conway's polynomial, the Alexander polynomial, is going to be zero for unlinks. And so that means that the knots M and the connected sum M bar of M bar is the connected sum of a trefoil with itself. Those two knots uh, have the same Conway Alexander polynomial. They're distinct knots, but you have to do something else to prove that. So these are some of the pleasant things that you can do with the skein calculation. No determinants around. You're just looking at the diagrams and seeing how they're seeing how nearby knots are relate knots and links are related through switching and smoothing, and finding out information, a kind of diagrammatic paradise, and very amazing. Um, here's another comment. Um, 
if we go back to the state sum and we have an alternating knot or link diagram, then you can examine the Conway Alexander state sum at x equals i. And that means, uh, what would that mean, x equals i? Let's go back to the, where the labels were so you can think about that. If x is equal to i here, then you have an i and you have a minus i, right? And a one and a one. Um, but after you have um, kept track of signs, well, no, never mind. You have an i and a minus i. And in the other case, you have a minus i and an i and a one and a one. That's what I mean. So you can think about how that states um, behaves. I'm not doing the detail. But if you do that, you'll discover that every state contributes exactly the same amount, some factor little complex number, product of those things. All the same. You can use the clock theorem to check that. You watch what happens from state to state and see that they all contribute the same thing. So that means that the number of maximal trees, that's what will be counted times some complex number of unit length. Um, that's what you will compute. If you take the absolute value, you'll just get the number of maximal trees. So the number of maximal trees in the checkerboard graph is an invariant of the alternating knot. And that's, sometimes people say, the determinant of the knot is equal to the number of maximal trees if the knot is alternating. And it turns out that this tree count is actually the coloring modulus, three for the trefoil, five for the figure eight. We didn't do the figure eight yet, and so on. Um, you can, of course, ask what else is in the state summation, and I don't think we know everything about that state summation yet, by far. Um, all this is quite incredible. I find it incredible anyway, but more was to come. After von Jones discovered a new invariant via von Neumann algebras in 1983, he saw that his polynomial satisfied a Conway type skein relation, and this was then generalized by Humphlet. That's Host, Okiano, Millet, Fried, Licorice, Yetter, Shatitsky, and Trasik uh, in various subgroups to uh, the following skein identity, which looks just like the Conway identity, except that as an extra variable, one multiplying the plus crossing and its inverse multiplying the minus crossing. This setup being invariant under all the Reitermeister moves and having the same axioms as Conway. And Kaufman found another skein invariant using unoriented diagrams um, and, and uh, also a specific state summation for Jones. But I think we should stop at this point. Um, and we can continue about some of this later on. Um, one point to make before I stop talking is that when you make this leap over to the Homflip polynomial and ask, well, what kind of models would that have? You're in a completely different ball game. Uh, it turns out to have models that are related to statistical mechanics and solutions to the Yang-Baxter equation. And we don't know how to generalize that model I showed you to get to the Homflip polynomial in a natural way. Although you might think there should be one. Um, I think so still. There should be some way of tweaking the model that I just showed you that started with Alexander and turning it into Homflip. I'll stop there. <laughs> Questions? Uh, Thank you very much. Say that again. Thank you very much. Oh, yes, you're welcome. I thought it was a question. No, no, not a question. It was very clear. Very well, then. Uh, we'll see you all on Friday. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Lou, um, and I should stop the recording now. <laughs>